The Bible actually says that your faith is futile and that you are stuck, pretty much stuck in your sin. If you don't believe me, you can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if you have your Bible open. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Now, some people would say, well, wait, you, you missed something very important in that verse. And it is an easy thing to miss. It's the first part of the verse. And sometimes um, I'm known for different phrases that I've had over the years. And one of my phrases is there's nothing worse than half a verse. Because half a verse, though, though it has maybe truth in it, it doesn't have the whole truth in it. And so this is what the whole verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says. It says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still stuck in your sins. And so I titled today's talk, The Big If, because that little word is a very big word. It says, if this is not true, well, man, everything falls apart. See, if this pivot point is not primary, if Christ is not risen, then our faith falls apart. It's just wishful thinking. It's just hopeful thoughts, but really, there's nothing to them. And so I like to put it this way, that the door of eternity hinges on a very big if, right? Again, your faith is futile, you're still in your sin. If, if the first part of that verse isn't there, that's, that's not a Bible verse anyone would want to memorize. Just my faith is futile, it, it means nothing, it's, it's hollow, it's empty, it's meaningless, that's what futile means. I'm still in my sin. What kind of hope does that have? And yet, if you go on to that primary thought, it's if Christ isn't risen, then that's true. But since he is, well, everything after that changes. See, and again, the door of eternity, it hinges on that big if. That's a very important little word. And so when you think about how important that is, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're just going to talk about the if, the if of life, the big if of life. And see, I think about it again this way. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. But let me just change it real quickly. If Christ is risen, your faith is not futile, right? I mean, that's, that's what that means. If Christ is not risen, you are still in your sin. But if Christ is risen, you're not still in your sin. So you see how important a little word can be, how important a little hinge can be. I think about it with these doors. These are big doors, right? Heavy doors, but they swing on little hinges. And I think sometimes in life, little things, the next time you look through a door and you go through a door, I think one of the biggest doors that any one of us could possibly face is the door to eternity. I mean, when you think about that, it's a fairly important door, right? I've gone through some important doors in life, um, but that's an important one. That's the one that's at the end of the hallway of life. There's this door that goes to the somewhat unknown, right? I mean, uh, even those who think they are, are say they know everything that lies on the other side of that door, they're, they're really not telling the truth. We, we don't know all that is on the other side of that. But we know something very important that's on the other side of that, which is a someone who's on the other side of that. And that's what the Bible talks about is Jesus being on the other side of that door and to open that door to people. And, and when you think about it, again, it hinges on a fairly important thing, which is what happened when he was here. See, it, again, it says if he's not risen because he either is or he isn't, right? I mean, that's not kind of like one of those theological or, or you know, just theoretical things. He either did rise from the dead or he didn't. See, if he did, well, then the gospel's true. If he didn't, well, it's wishful thinking. It's just another philosophy. And see, I think about it. If he did, we have hope. If he didn't, we're left hopeless. And see, the chapter here, 15, Paul hits the biggest question in life, and it's a little bitty word, if. Well, I don't know if there's meaning to life. I don't know if there's a God. I don't know if God 
has anything for us after this. I, I, I don't know those things. Many would say that. And so, again, how big is that if? Well, for me, it's huge. I mean, when you think about this, everything in this life hinges also on this for me. Because if Christ is not risen, well, I guess nobody is. Because if ever anyone deserved to live forever, it was certainly him. And so you go, okay, here's a guy who, when you look at the life that he lived, you look at the death that he died, there's a, there's a horrible injustice in it, right? I mean, the cross, the crucifixion, all of those things. If it's just a fiction, the cruci crucifixion, well, then it's, it's kind of a sad but strange story. But the question is, did he rise again? Did he really rise again? That's a pretty big if, I think. Because if when this life is over, it's really over, well, that changes everything for me. In fact, in this chapter, Paul even says, you should live totally different, differently depending on how you feel about this, depending on what you conclude about this if. See, what if, what if a man really did come back from the dead? What if somebody really did defeat death? Again, that's a big if. I don't know if you would be a follower of Jesus. I don't know if you are. But if, if you were, if you, if you are, every person you meet, if they are, I don't know if I would be a follower of Jesus if he was just a man who lived and died 2,000 years ago. And a, that was kind of the end of the story. You know, I've, I've sometimes in my mind chopped off the Gospels minus the last chapter, right? And you go, okay, there's this guy, and he lived this amazing life. He said some pretty cool stuff, some of it very challenging, frankly, that I don't know if it's the easiest way to live. It's a very hard way to live. I mean, he sometimes asks us to do some very, very uncomfortable things, like love people who don't love us and things like that. So I don't know if I'd be in love with everything he said. He said some great stuff, some of it very quotable, some of it, you know, very difficult. But then his life came to this horrible conclusion of, of probably the worst death imaginable. And you go, well, what if that was it? Would you go, I want to model my life after that guy. Look where it got him. You know, it seemed to work out great for him. No, it didn't, actually. It didn't work out well for him at all. And so you start asking yourself, well, if he didn't come back from the dead, if, if there isn't another chapter to that story... Boy, that changes a lot. There were enemies of his message back then. There'll be enemies of his message even now. And I think about it this way. If people had wanted to discredit Christ or Christianity, the first century would have been a great time to do it. See, I, again, I think a lot of times people try to come against it now, and certainly they can try to do that. But, but back then, that would have been a great time to quench it in its infancy, right? I mean, it was just getting started. And anytime something's just getting started, it's a great time to, to end it, right? I mean, you think about a tree, right? A tree, when it's little, you just kind of pluck it out. You just kind of knock it over. In fact, you have to really prop it up to even give it any hope, right? And so right then, if, if Christianity as a thing was ever fragile, it certainly was fragile then, and so you think about it, all it would have taken to discredit what Christianity was all built on was produce the body, produce the dead body of Jesus, and just say that there it is. All of these rumors, all of these myths, all of this hopeful thinking, all of this preaching, it really comes to nothing because there he is. He died. He died publicly. He, uh, that's all they did have to do in those days. But no one did, and no one could. And when you think about this, the resurrection of Jesus is, I believe, the most important event of all human history. So this is arguably one of the most important chapters in the Bible about one of the most important things we could definitely wrestle with. And what it does is it shows us the connection, the resurrection connection, which is the thing between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of Christians. Because again, if you just kind of leave it at that and say, well, Jesus resurrected, but you won't. You know, he lives forever, but you can't. Then again, it's kind of like, well, that, that leaves it somewhat less than it could be. And so this is what this chapter does. It connects the fact that Jesus resurrects. And it says, you know what? Because he did, you will. And because he could, you can. 
And so when you think about that, if Jesus did not, what hope is there for us? But if Jesus did, what hope there is for us? And so you think about this, verse 1, if you look at it with me, again, we'll get to that middle verse that I talked about already. But he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, and which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, anyone who, reading Paul's writings has to kind of state, you know, with thinking, because he, he was a thinker. He was a uh, learned man. He was a guy whose writings are difficult at times. And so we take some time to look at these things and kind of chew on them. Uh, but he has lots of commas in there, right? Lots of comments in this one little dense portion. But some in Corinth were trying to take the resurrection out of Christianity. Whether they were Christian or non-Christian, they were saying, well, does the resurrection really matter? Let's, let's not debate that one too, too much. Let's make this a moral or ethical debate, right? And those happen every day. I mean, this is right, this is wrong, this is right for you, that's wrong for you, all that kind of stuff. People do that even yet to this day, right? They say, well, that, you know, that's what you believe, this is what I believe. But this is the thing. If Christ is not risen, I don't care what you believe. I mean, seriously, on some level you go, there's lots of people who said amazing things in history, but if they died at the end of it all, so did their thoughts and so did their actions and so did everything. If it just comes to a conclusion at the conclusion, the only conclusion is, so what about life, right? I mean, and, and many have done that. Philosophers have, have collapsed it into meaninglessness, you know, the nihilists, the existentialists. So many have just said, what's the point? But Jesus comes and points to something and says, you know what? <laughs> if I come back from the dead, if I defeat death, and life goes on and on and on after death, well, that changes everything. See, and I think about this is what Paul was saying. You can't take the resurrection out of Christianity. You can't take the fact that Christ is risen out of it. Otherwise, it's just another philosophy. And he's nearing the end of this long letter, and he's reminding them what they already knew. He said, I already declared it to you. I already made this the major point. And again, you guys wrote some things, and we talked about, you know, all kinds of stuff. You remember it if you were here. But it was like, you know, this... Thing or what you wear in church or what hair length you have and all these different cultural things that he was addressing of how they could live their life in an ethical or moral way that affected the people around them. But he said, hey, let's not forget, if there's no resurrection, who cares, right? I mean, <laughs> do whatever you want because it doesn't matter because none of us matter. We're just matter. We're just physical matter and who cares? But he says, but if we're more than that, it does matter. And so you think about this, it's the big if. If it's true, good news. If it's not true, no good news, right? So salvation, he puts it in three parts, and I love this. He, he packs this all in there. He talks about the past, present, and future. He says, it's in the past, you've received this. You already received this good news. He says, and in the present, you stand in this good news. But he said, but keep standing in it. Don't like think you move on past it or go, oh, that's, well, that's the elementary things. That's the basic stuff. He says, this is you can't go past this thing. I mean, well, let's move on past the resurrection of Jesus. He says, how could you possibly do that? There isn't a bigger answer than this. This is the big answer that does it all for all of them. And I think about this. I wrote it down this way, that our faith is built on several things, but one is facts, prophetic predictions. I think this is an important thing. Some people ask me why I, I believe the Bible. One of the reasons I believe the Bible is a special book is because it's a special book, um, because it has a special look. What I mean by that is it looks at history through a lens of knowing things before it happened. And I think that's pretty impressive. You know, again, I, I didn't always believe the Bible like I do today. And I'm like one of many who've approached it by saying, well, I don't know it that well, so I don't believe it. I think it's full of contradictions or whatever. You start reading it and you try to look for those. Many have done that. And some of the greatest minds, I'm not saying I'm one of them, but some of the greatest minds in history came to the Bible to disprove it and ended up going, but wait, wow, whoa, this is, that's pretty interesting. There's no other book like this. 
And so this is what Paul is saying here in verse 3. He says, I delivered to you, first of all, what I also received, which is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you think about that simple little phrase, according to the scriptures, this is what he's saying. You know I like rhymes. One of the books in the Bible, an important one, is the book of Acts. The book of Acts, which is all these guys going out and doing things because they answered the big if. <laughs> Christ is risen. It's no longer an if for them. It was an is. But this is what I wrote down. Facts gave us Acts. Facts gave us Acts. The book of Acts wouldn't have happened if it wasn't built on facts because these guys knew the scriptures well. Unlike a lot of people today, maybe people are you know, ignorant sometimes of the Bible. I don't mean that as a criticism, but they are. And in that ignorance, sometimes they'll just say, ah, it's just another book, right? But then you start showing them some things and go, I didn't know that was in there. Would, would it interest you to know this is in there? But yeah, that, wow, I, didn't, I did not know that. See that the core of Christianity is built around facts, faith in facts. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again, and he says, according to the scriptures. Now, again, the entire book of Leviticus, not on most people's top reading list right now in America or elsewhere, but Leviticus was a whole sacrificial system where you had a lamb inspected and given for the sin of the people. And you see that that in and of itself was just many times that God gave this prophetic picture of what Jesus even came to do. You see over and over again in so many different ways the same thing, the same story told over and again, which is a sacrifice of an innocent one for a guilty one. It's innocent given for the guilty. Innocent given for the guilty. You see this in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 incidentally was written about a thousand years before Jesus came on the scene and before crucifixion was even invented. And yet Psalm 22, lesser known than Psalm 23, right? That a lot of people know. It's also a good one. But Psalm 22, this is what it says. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. Now anyone who knows anything about the uh, gospel accounts knows that this is exactly what happens. And again, when you think about that, some people say, well, you're using the Bible to prove the Bible. Well, the, the thing about that is even historians who were non-biblical accounts did say that there was a man named Jesus who kind of crossed a stir in the first century and ended up getting crucified like so many others do. So at a minimum, you look at Psalm 22 and go, pierce my hands and my feet. That wasn't something they were doing a thousand years before. Even historians know that. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. You know Isaiah 53 is quite a chapter if you know Isaiah. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We didn't esteem him. We considered him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes, with his beatings, with the flaying that he received. We are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him. Who him? The iniquity of us all. Here's a sacrificial somebody, a savior who would suffer and take the place of other people. This is what it talks about. Daniel 9. Again, I'm just taking one of hundreds, literally hundreds of prophecies that are there. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Again, what's glorious about these? These were all discovered in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, when they were there. It, people rushed out to, to investigate the Dead Sea Scrolls only to find that they agreed with the existent manuscripts and you're like oh wow okay so this stuff's been around before Jesus and then Jesus came along and did exactly these things Daniel 9 verse 26 it says after the 62 weeks that's a whole teaching that I'd love to give another time but then it says Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself so he'll be killed but not for himself well who's, what's he being killed for it just says right there your sins the People of the prince who is to come, that's talking about the enemy of your souls. It says, shall destroy, destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, again, when you think about this, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, if you know that one, it's one of my favorite 
thoughts that he gave a Bible study to uh, his non-believing believers, you know, guys who walked away from the crucifixion going, well, I guess our faith is futile. I guess we're still in our sins. I guess he wasn't who he said he was. And Jesus himself, risen Jesus, comes right beside him and says, what y'all talking about? And they say, oh, just the hopelessness of everything because everything we believed has turned out to be a lie. He says, oh, you foolish ones and slow to believe all that the scriptures have said. And then it says he gave them a Bible study on the road from Genesis all the way to Malachi of all of the things that spoke were spoken in the Old Testament concerning himself. And they went, I was in Sabbath school, all those Sabbaths, and I never got it. And he's like, exactly. Because it's the facts that led to the acts. These guys turned around, their whole life turned around on this big if, again, that if thing. So this is the kind of thought that I want to have you in your mind, have in your mind. This has nothing to do with Miffy, who's wonderful, but iffy. What is iffy? Iffy means questionable, sketchy, not real. Um, you know, and this is the thought. There's nothing iffy about Jesus. Like when I look at his life, again, I had a totally different perspective of him for much of my adult life. But as I began to look and search into these things, I went, man, this guy, there's something to this guy. I think he actually did what he said he was going to do. There's a whole set of sacred writings that says some guy's going to come and do this. And then a guy came and said, I'm going to come and do this. And nobody believed him while he was here. And then even after he did it, he had to convince them. But he did convince them. And once he convinced them that he was back from the dead, everything changed in their life. In fact, they willingly faced death and refused to recount the fact that they knew, hey, he, it's not an if for me anymore. There's no iffy thing about it. See, he goes on to talk about this, eyewitness accounts, right? This was a very, very important thought. It's the place of testing for every person. Verse 5, he says, he was seen by Cephas. That you can put in parentheses Peter because that's, that's the name for Peter the Apostle. It's just another name like we often have in our society too. Then by the 12, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Can I remind you this letter was written in the first century, okay? It was written, scholars believe, about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, you know, one of the earliest writings in the New Testament. And this is what Paul says even in here. Again, it would have been really easy to rip up this letter and refute it if he says, uh, the greater part of these are still alive in here. And they're like, no, they aren't. Well, yes, they are. I mean, they were still there. This group of people went from scared to death to not scared of death. How did that happen? They answered the big if. And it was no longer an if for them. See, the, the book, again, 1 Corinthians, it, it says there in that verse, over 500 at once. See, when you think about something that a whole lot of people saw at one time, it, there's just a lot more credence to that, you know, than something that I ever got. Well, I'm the only guy who saw it. You know, I, I shot a full court shot behind my back. Did anyone see it? Nope. But I'm telling you, it's true, right? But what if you're at an event and there's 500 people there and they watch the ball and they go, I saw it, I saw it too, I saw it too. Now again, we would have had cell phone uh, video if this had been done in our age and time, but then we wouldn't need faith, would we? Because we'd have the video. But what we do have is a very credible set of witnesses who did what uh, our judicial system puts additional weight on somebody who to their own harm will say something right it's it's actually if my testimony actually they said we're going to put you to death if you don't change your testimony and you go no it's just as i saw it and they put them to death for it and they still didn't change why well again witness number one witness number two let's call witness number 499 all at once that's saying at one time but there were many more who saw Jesus alive. So I think about this. He says, some have died, but most of them are still around. You can go ask them if you'd like. And so changed lives. 
it's very important. That was quite a witness back then. Verse 7, notice this. It says, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also. This is Paul. He says, as one born out of due time, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. This is so important. He's saying here, I was busy stamping Christianity out and Till I kind of ran into Jesus after the crucifixion. And that, well, that kind of, that shook my world quite a bit. He said, you know, after I, I told people, stop lying about some guy who says he was the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. I'm Jewish. I know these things. I know the scripture. Oh, hi, Jesus. What are you doing back from the dead? And he, he lost everything. Paul counted everything lost after this day. He was a guy who had prestige, power. He had it made in this life until Jesus changed everything with the big if in his life. He says, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than everyone, yet not me, the grace of God, which was with me. And verse 11, he says, therefore, whether it is I or they, so we preach, so you believe. What's he saying? We all agree on this. He said, you got people who are so different, you can't imagine how different they are. People who couldn't agree on where to go to lunch prior to this have all agreed. I saw him. He's back from the dead. I'm telling you, I didn't agree with him when he was here the first time, but I agree with him now. I can't deny I saw what I saw and heard what I heard. You think about this, the resurrection changed lives. It did then, it does now. I think one of the most powerful uh, evidences of Christ today is some of the people I've met who were so incredibly different before they met Christ. If he's not risen, I don't know how to explain what happened in that person's life. I just simply don't. Um, because we tried to change them, they tried to change them, everything tried to change them, and they never changed. And then they came to answer the big if, if Christ, is Christ risen? And when he proved himself to them to be alive today through the scriptures and through his interaction with them, they changed. And you go, well, Paul's saying that. I, you, don't, you don't have to listen to me. He said, you could listen to all these people. Peter, think about Peter prior to the resurrection. Remember that guy? What's funny about the gospels, one of the reasons I really believe them is they're so honest about the heroes right when whenever you see like scriptures these guys are not painted in the best of light right the heroes of scripture are all kind of like bums half the time half the time they don't even do the right thing say the right thing and i really appreciate that but peter was a guy who was always messing up always and peter denied jesus in front of a servant girl three times on the night of jesus's betrayal he said you can count on me and Jesus said, I am going to count on you one, two, three times you're going to deny me. He said, oh, I would never do that. You, I'm Peter, you know, and all this. And he blew it. He couldn't stand up to a little bit of pressure. But then here's the irony. Here's the amazing thought. Think about this. After the resurrection, what did Peter do? Peter preached to thousands Peter didn't deny Jesus in front of anybody. In fact, history tells us that he was crucified upside down. And they gave him an option of saying, like, you know, you don't have to go through with this. All you got to do is say all this stuff you're saying is not true. And he said, bring it on. And you think about that and you go, how, how, what changed Peter? He answered the big if. It was no longer an if in his life. Nothing iffy about it. You think about the 12. They were always arguing about who's the greatest. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. That's all they did. They fought amongst each other. They misrepresented Jesus the whole time he was here on earth. And then he said, someday you guys are going to get it. And what day did they get it? When they saw him back from the dead, they said, you know what? Maybe he's Maybe he's right. They were scattered. They were scared. The scriptures even say in books, book of Acts, <laughs> all the facts in the world hadn't changed them. But what did change them is this one thought, which is he said, lo, I am with you always into the, uh, into the age. And they said, I believe it. Because he kept showing up in rooms that they'd lock the door to keep people out. They're like, lock the door. They're coming to get us. And Jesus would be like, what y'all doing in here? It was no longer an if for them. Something changed after the resurrection. 
Again, when you think about that, they were all martyrs' death that they lived with. And I think people will die for something they believe to be true, even if it's not true, right? But these guys, they knew it to be true. They experienced it to be true. James, he's one of my favorite. He's mentioned in verse 7. You know why James is so cool? He was part of Jesus' physical family. He grew up as a stepbrother of Jesus, right? And you think about this. He didn't believe that Jesus was who Jesus said he was. Now think about this. He grew up as, with a perfect sibling, perfect sibling. Why can't you be more like Jesus, James? You know, Jesus never disobeyed his parents, right? He, he stayed there in Jerusalem, and they, they thought of that as disobedience, but he said, actually, I'm, I got to obey God my father in heaven, right? So I, if I got to choose between my earthly father and my heavenly father, I'll obey him. But he went home and was subject to Mary and Jacob. I mean, to uh, Mary and Jacob. Yeah. Joseph. Joseph. <laughs> okay. See, you think about this. James, he grew up like that, heard the teaching, still didn't believe. What changed his mind? Have you ever thought about this? What, what changed James' mind if he grew up with Jesus physically? A perfect person and still didn't believe. But he came and saw his brother after death. And his brother watched it all go down. He knew exactly what had happened. And he said, there's something to him. He's not just a good guy. He's not just a good brother. He's God. <laughs> and that was the big if. You think of Paul, once a Christian killer, a hitman. What changed him? The resurrected Christ. I could go on and on, but the resurrection is the foundation of their faith and of ours. Again, if, if Jesus is not alive today to work in my life right now, he said, I can do today what I did then. Greater things will you do than the first century people did. Why? Because he says, I'm still with you. I am alive right now. I mean, Jesus is alive right now, and he lives in the hearts of those who have taken away the if and replaced it with a he is risen <laughs> he is it's a very small change but if you take away the resurrection of christ christianity crumbles but i think about it this way my friends if you take away the resurrection christians crumble christians crumble i mean i look at my own life i look at the things you guys face i look at the things all of us are going to face and i don't just need a philosophy right Philosophies are nice. Ideas are nice. I need God to be real and to show up for real in my life, right? I know that's what you need too. And that's when I look at these things, I'm like, you know what? All of the fancy thoughts in the world are not enough for those moments that we all know we go through. Now, verse 12, he says, if Christ is preached, he's been raised from the dead. How is it that some among you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, Christ is not risen. This is what he's saying in verse 13. Look, if, if nobody resurrects, then certainly Jesus didn't resurrect. He's just kind of laying out that thought, of course. But look what happens. This is what I was saying. I'm, I, we kind of built up to this, but these are not happy words. The words that you're going to see in here are empty, false, futile, still in sins, perish, pitiable. I mean, these are not happy verses if, if the if is still there in a person's life. He says, if, verse 14, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Your faith is also empty. It's futile. Now, I, I have a computer background, a computer science background, IT background. And... Uh, Programming is, is all about if then. Uh, when I teach kids, I teach kids even today, uh, it doesn't matter what language is, it, it's the logic. The logic is if this, then that. If not this, then not that. And things like that. That's how computers work. If you've ever wondered, how, how does my computer know what I'm doing? It's just asking a lot of if questions. If the mouse moved, then move. You know, if the mouse didn't move, then don't do anything. If they hit the S key, then put an S to the screen. If they didn't, then don't. It's just that. It's a bunch of very simple questions. As smart as computers are or aren't, it's basically if, then. And this is what Paul's saying. Look, man, it comes down to this. It boils down to that. If Christ isn't risen, then a lot of things fall apart. The program crashes. The entire Christian program crashes around this one if. 
He says, yes, verse 15, and we're found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, he, who he didn't raise up if the, if the dead don't rise. He's, he's basically saying, I'm, I'm a big stinking liar. And not only that, I'm telling lies about God, which is, if you're going to lie about anyone, don't lie about him. And verse 16, he says, and if the dead don't rise, Christ isn't risen. And if Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And those who've fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. I mean, Paul's like not pulling punches there, right? He says, that's a big if. If Jesus didn't resurrect, here's the things that are true. Preaching is pointless. What I'm doing right now, which I have dedicated my life to, didn't matter. I should have just gone and ridden my bike. You guys shouldn't waste your time coming here. You shouldn't waste your time going anywhere except exactly what is in the moment because who cares, right? This is what he's saying. We're preaching that there's more to life than this. But what if there isn't? That's what he's saying. If Christ isn't risen, this is it. Don't waste your time. Your faith is futile. It's only as good as its object, right? If I put my faith in the stool and the stool doesn't stand, I was stupid. I put my faith in something that didn't hold me up, right? It just <laughs> collapsed. He says, your leaders are liars. When you think about this, you look back through the history of our culture, our society, even non-American society. I mean, European history, all of this, world history, the great advancers of thought, so many of them, it was thoughts of God and that there's, we're not just animals and that there's more to, to all of this and that there's an eternity and there's an accountability to all that. And you go, those guys were just making it up, just liars. We make statues of them, but tear them down. They're, what do they know? They weren't even telling the truth. You know, these people that we've looked up to and put in stained glass, what's, what a waste. This is what he's saying. I mean, this is really heavy thought to it. It's a big if. All the comforting words at grave sites that you've ever heard, just words. That's what he's saying. If Christ is not risen. It means you'd never, I mean, again, I don't mean to just be meaninglessly uh, emotional or applying to that or anything but I think it's it's important to go there I have lost loved ones and what Paul is saying is the difference between whether they're lost or found is found right here this is it this is it it's on the side of this if question if Christ is not risen your loved ones are lost if Christ is risen they're not right and I love the fact that one of the, the guys who, who I learned so much from and looked up to so much, unflappable guy, really, um, incredible pastor. But he, he had a wife who died in a car accident and a young daughter who died in a car accident. And he, people would come to him sometimes and say, oh, man, I, I, I'm so sorry. I heard that your, your daughter, you lost your daughter. And he said, no, 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 that's a false report. He said, I, I know exactly where she is. I haven't lost her. I know where she is. In fact, I, I'm more aware of where she is all the time than I would be if she was here on earth. Here on earth, I could lose her. Uh, in heaven, I'd never lose her. And, and I think about those things and you go, well, man, those are, those are pretty profound words. And you go, oh, wishful thinking. You know, I, whatever gets you through the night. This is what Paul's saying. You should feel sorry for someone who lives under an illusion and only has false hope. Because he says, you know what? I, I'm going to go a, a little off notes here because I, I just, it was in a conversation I had with a, a great friend of mine at work. And he has gone through an incredibly difficult time. And some of you have, have met him. But he had twin boys who were born. And one of those twins is still here on earth. And one is already in heaven and lived about a month. And not a day goes by that I don't end up talking with him about that. It is profoundly affecting his life. Uh, that life matters to him and both of them. In fact, the son's name is Gunnison and he and his wife uh, used our break to fly to Gunnison, Colorado, uh, which is where he was named after. They said, you know what, we, just, we have a sense that God is just 
going to do some healing in our life there. We just we love Colorado. We love the outdoors, and we're just going to take some hikes and in Gunnison, the place that we named our son after, who who's already in heaven, you know. And uh, the other day, his his dog. Um, was attacked by he lives on a farm and his dog was attacked by other wild dogs and he had to bury that dog and i was like this guy i've just been i've been so broken hearted for him through all of this but i've been thinking to myself again you know <laughs> the resurrection is really important i mean it really matters it really really matters and Life is very unfair if there's no punishment for the wicked and no reward for the righteous. You know, you look back at, at Las Vegas just this week, you know, and you think to yourself, well, if there's no eternity, there's no eternity. I mean, th this is like where he puts all of this on the line, and I love it, because there's a lot riding on the resurrection. And this is why verse 20 is probably the best verse in the Bible, at least today it is. But now Christ is risen. He says, forget all the ifs. Forget the big if. It's the big is. <laughs> Christ is. He is risen from the dead. And he's become the first fruits of those who fall asleep. Why does that first fruit word matter? Well, when the big if becomes the big is, Christ is risen, it, it reverses all the signs. Think about this. Preaching isn't pointless. Sometimes mine might be. Where you go? Uh, find a point, Scott. Okay, uh, let's see. F faith is not futile. There's a point. Um, but, you know, sometimes it can be, but it means, you know what? If the gospel, if the message of Jesus is being preached, it's not a waste. If you have shared your faith with someone, it wasn't a waste. If you've lived your faith out in front of others or in your own life, it wasn't wasted. The leaders that have come before you weren't lying when they said that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, and lives forever to intercede for those who believe in him. They weren't just making that up, right? This is Paul saying your sin, you're not still in your sin. That regret you have, that thing you did, that, that thing you can't forget, God has forgotten. Why? Because Jesus is back from the dead. That's what he's saying. If, if death is the end, well, then sin won. But he said, guess what? Death lost. Death lost. Sin lost. The Savior won. The dead in Christ didn't perish. People already dead are not gone. They're more alive than ever. And if we have that trust, we have that faith, guess what? We will see them. We will see in Christ. And we will see each other forever. When you think about this, it pays to live a righteous life. And it doesn't pay to live an unrighteous life. But it, if this is all there is, it could look different, couldn't it? I know people who have successfully, till the day they died, as far as you could tell, lived a completely unrighteous life and been rewarded for it. Got the money they wanted, got the pleasure they wanted, got everything they went after, and you go, and then I've seen, I, and you've seen it too, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So, there, uh, so many people come to mind, but there's a, a lady that we know and love who has had tragedy after tragedy in her life. And I think to myself, this thing is the biggest ripoff that has ever occurred unless if Jesus was right. In this world, you will have trouble, but fear not. I have overcome the world. Your life may be harder because you follow Jesus. See, this is what I think when I think of this more pitied. Let this shape some of your thoughts on the Bible because, you know what, there are people who preach, and I'm not dogging them, but there's people who preach, come to Jesus and get the good life now, right? Well, my life's good now, it is. But would this be a true statement that I'm the most pitiable if it's false hope? That's not true. If everything works out, whether it's true or not, might as well believe it because it won't cost you anything. It cost Paul everything. And he's saying, I'm an idiot if Christ was not raised. I should have stayed a Pharisee. 
I should have stayed in the Sanhedrin. I should have gone to the public meetings and have everyone honor me instead of being lowered out windows in the middle of the night in a basket and being shipwrecked time after time and being flogged. I mean, why would I have done that if Christ isn't risen? If this is all there is, you should feel sorry for me. I mean, that's a pretty interesting thought because it shapes what we could expect in following Christ. Because again, if there's no resurrection, I'm not sure I'm following this guy. Why? Because all the rewards aren't here. There are rewards here, and there are rewards there. Now again, some of it is, the truth is, I have a better marriage, better family, better friends, better life as a result of Christ. But the truth is also, I think we've gone through a little bit more roller coaster ride than we ever did before we said, I will follow you through the ups and downs. I will follow you through the good and bad. I will follow you through the sunny days and the dark days. And that's what Jesus said. And this is what Paul is saying. And what I love about it, he says, they become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. What happened? People who believed in Jesus died. See, this is important because, again, they died just like unbelievers died. Death came to Jesus. It came to those who followed him. It comes. And when you think about this, he says, but Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of the ones who already died. What is first fruit? This is, again, the richness of the Bible. I've, again, had people many times tell me, well, I'm a New Testament believer. I don't really look at the Old Testament. I love looking at the Old Testament. Why? Because... It's this cohesive whole message that keeps saying the same thing over again. What's the first fruits? The pictures found in the feast. The cycle of seven feasts there in the Jewish system are a whole study that would be fun to do. But Jesus died on the Passover. That was one of the big feasts of the Jews, was the Passover. And it was really a, a picture of them getting out of Egypt. But Egypt, they would pass over, and the angel of death would pass over, and the lamb would be sacrificed, and all this stuff. And it's the gospel right there in the Old Testament. Amazing. And then you have them out of slavery and into the life that God promised them, right? But then you see that there was a, a feast that came after this, after the Passover on the calendar, and it was the Feast of First Fruits, and that's what he's referring to. The First Fruits was a crop-oriented one. It was basically saying this, the, the very first things that came out of the ground, the seed that grew, they would sacrifice it to God. Now, that was an act of faith, if you think about it. Uh, for me, when I need food, I go to the grocery store, right? When they needed food, they went to the ground, right? It was, everything was organic, right? Everything was non-GMO. It was grown right there in their backyard. And so they would plant a season and they would, you know, you're probably running out of last season's food by this point. And the very first thing that would come out of the ground, the first tomato, they would offer it to God. Now you think about that and you go, yikes. See, I'd be like going, uh, can we give you the last fruits, like the leftovers, the things that if we didn't use it all? No, he says, the first thing, you're going to do that. But that feast was them celebrating. Why? Because it said, we believe that just as sure as the first ones came in, the rest of the crop is coming in. And this is what he's saying right here with this. He's saying, guess what? The first fruits, the people who've already come back from the dead. Do you know the account of Jesus, one of those little things that gets almost overlooked? It says when he came back from the dead, the graves opened and a bunch of people came back from the dead and walked around Jerusalem. Now, again, you can look at that and say, I don't believe that. Man, if I don't believe Jesus came back, then I don't believe that. That's a big if. But if Jesus came back, he can do whatever he wants. And... For a time, there were people saying, is that Jesus over there? And, uh, wait a minute, what is that guy doing here? Now, of course, they, they all went away again. But when you think about this, this is what he's saying. The ones you've already seen are proof of the ones you haven't already seen. And I think about that. I have, again, a list and a growing list of people who are on the other side of the big if door, right? And that's part of life. More and more, there's people on the other side and you look around and you say, wow, I wonder if I'll be the last one <laughs> standing. You know, because so many are on the other side of that. But he says, that's it. 
you're guaranteeing the whole harvest. It, when God accepted Jesus, he's connecting that to you and saying, I'll also bring back his followers. If you're a follower of his, you get to come with him. The fact that God accepted him means that God will accept you. It's not just that, oh, well, Jesus resurrected. Good for him. No, good for you. Good for us. Good for those who follow in his footsteps. See, you think about this, the resurrection and our resurrection are very intimately related. And I think about this, think about the two biggest miracles. If I were to ask you, what are the biggest miracles in the Bible? I think the two biggest ones are the incarnation and the resurrection. Okay, the incarnation is we celebrate it at Christmas. The resurrection we celebrate it at Easter, right? Those are the two big cycles in the, in the thing. But why is, why is the incarnation such a big deal? Well, because if God just came as God, but not as God as a man, right? That's kind of cool, but it's not that cool. Sometimes people say, I wish God just ripped the heavens open and say, here I am. I think he did something more impressive than that. He walked the dusty earth and said, here I am. He didn't just stand above us and say, wow, it looks rough down there. He actually walked among real life people and real suffering. And he suffered himself. The incarnation, God became a man. See, if Jesus were God and nothing else, then his immortality doesn't mean much to me. It's impressive for him. Yeah, okay, you've always been, you'll always be, so what? But he says, I entered time and I brought you the first fruits with me. I brought people with me and I'm continuing to do that and the crop will come in. See, I think about this, if he was man and nothing more, he's just a really godly guy, then his death is no more important than any of the other great people who've died over the length of time. Because again, their life's work collapses upon the meaningless of all of it. But verse 21, he says, since by man came death, by man also, capitalized man, it's talking about Jesus, also came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And I'm going to just kind of step on the gas through this part, but you can go home and look at it. It's a lot of important stuff in it. But he, he talks about in Adam, Adam was the, the first man, the, the, the most perfect human who wasn't God, right? Just made by God. And how long did it last? Three chapters. You know, that didn't go very well. So you have a guy who, who was innocent, you know, didn't, didn't really have sin and all this, but sin came in and just wrecked it all, right? And he says, in Christ, that was reversed. That curse was reversed. And in Christ, you have the inheritance of life. The same way Adam gave you a bodily death, a bodily death, uh, life that is subject to bodily death. He says, guess what? Jesus will give you a eternal life, not subject to death. And see, he says in verse 23, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, verse 27, but when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. He's basically saying God isn't under Jesus. Verse 28, now when all things were made subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. That's a very complex section of scripture. Uh, what I would invite you to do when you think about it is he's basically saying Jesus came down, lowered himself to be a human, uh, but he was still God. God is a man. He went back. He gives everything to God the Father, and he, it, God is back to being God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, he's all, he's everything, you know, don't lower him. And so Jesus has fully realized something, the redemption at the end of the age. It's, it's basically saying that though it was finished at the cross, it's not really finished in every person's life. See, I think about it this way, is salvation 100% complete in my life? Well, remember, he, he used it past, present, and future, didn't he? He said, the salvation that was accomplished the salvation that's being accomplished, the salvation that will be accomplished. And I love that because what he's saying is, yeah, finished in God's eyes, finished in God's mind, but in each person it's worked out and 
played out in my life. And am I completely saved from sin right now? No, I have to deal with it every day. But there will be a time in the future where past, present, and future will all be wound up together and God says, salvation, fully done, all over. We can just enjoy eternity. Verse 29, he says, otherwise, what will be... What do they do who are baptized for the dead? This is, again, we go verse by verse through here. This would be a skipper, but I won't skip it. Um, what do they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead don't rise? Why are they baptized for the dead? This is a very bizarre scripture because people have debated this. What, what is baptized for the dead? Well, um, if you know anything about certain uh, non-biblical beliefs, there are, there are, Bibli um, there are I'll call them pagan, they are, um, you know, again, non-scriptural beliefs that there are people who baptize and water baptize for other people as if that's going to help them, you know, the ancestors or whatever. And I'm not trying to be insensitive to that, but it's just a fact. Notice that Paul doesn't say we, he says they. He is not saying, why do we do this? We don't do this. Because there's been people who say, well, can I like be baptized for somebody else? Paul was saying they do this. He's, this is my interpretation of this verse, and I think a lot of other people agree. Verse 29, he's basically saying, look, the, the pagans around you in Corinth even do this, so they believe there's a life after death. He says they, they, they try to take care of people who've died already, and they do something now to try to help their then. Uh, but he said that's not going to, we don't even do that. And then he says, verse 30, he says, this is what I do. I stand in jeopardy every hour. Verse 31, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus, I die daily. If in the manner of men I've fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead don't rise, let us eat, drink, and be merry. You know, that's elsewhere put in the scripture. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. He says, awake to righteousness, don't sin. Some of you don't have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So again, bringing this, this thing kind of to a, a, a conclusion, there's one more major thought that'll take me about five to 10 minutes. But it says, if, if the big if is just theological, if, it, if it, that's all it is, he's saying, you got to live it out practically. It's going to make a difference in how you live now. I wrote it down this way, I've said it before, what you're believing is how you'll be living. What you're believing is how you'll be living. If you believe, uh, let's see, we're animals, uh, we live however many years, we go to the dirt and that's the end of it. Well, you probably live a pretty dirty life on some level. Well, I mean, why, why not? Um, there's pleasure in things that are selfishness. There's, you know, sometimes it costs a lot to be selfless. Uh, how could you say there's a moral right and wrong if you don't have any thing that goes beyond the few years that you're here? Is it moral or right for one animal to kill another animal? But it's just the way of the world. So, so whenever we look on at something and go, well, that's not right, what are we saying? We're saying, I, I believe something. I believe there's a right and a wrong. I believe there's just and unjust. I believe there's something more to a human than just molecules I think people matter right and he says well if not just eat and drink and you're dead tomorrow who cares and he says don't don't deceive yourself into thinking that what you the people you hang out with won't make a difference too see I like to believe I like to be around people who believe that there's more to life than what you see I can't stand being around people who think this is all there is I, it's so hard to be around them. This is what he's saying. You know, contextually, don't hang around with people who live like this is the only life. Verse 35, someone will say, but how are the dead raised up? What body did they come? These were the Greek philosophers who basically said, well, I don't understand how it works. You know, the, there was also in his day the Sadducees, they called them. And I always say they're sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That was what was unique about them. And when you look at the Sadducees, they were a group who believed in a moral code, an ethical thing, the existence of God, but they didn't believe we would ever, we weren't eternal, he was. So we were just here for a little while and then gone. And I go, yeah, man, that would make you sad, you see. And this is verse 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow 
you don't sow the body that shall be, but mere grain, sometimes wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he pleases to each seed its own body. He says all flesh, verse 39, isn't the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another of animals, another of fish, another of birds. And he says, verse 40 and 41, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. And then finally he says in verse 42, there he says, if also there's a resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, verse 44, it's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. See, when I think about this, what is he saying through all of these things? He reiterates it many, many different ways. But he's basically saying, <laughs> you, you plant a seed, you don't plant the flower, right? You plant a seed. You put a seed in the ground, you get a flower. You plant a thing, you get an oak tree. But you don't plant an oak tree, you plant a, the little seed. And he's saying the difference between those in glory is tremendous, you know? Like, I, Lynn might on some level uh, appreciate a, a, a packet of seeds, you know, and here, I gave you this for Mother's Day, packet of seeds. Um, but, you know, like even this morning, Diane brought in flowers, which is really awesome in their, in their glory and beauty. They're more beautiful than the seeds they came from. I mean, maybe a farmer could look and go, oh, look at that seed. What a glorious and beautiful seed. But he says, basically, the seed is nothing compared to what comes out of it. And this is what he's saying. We look around and we see our bodies and we go, man, they're pretty impressive in some ways. Or we try to hold them together for a while. And he says, you know what? We're weak, man. We stink. We fall apart. But he says, but guess what? In that act, don't be sad for the seed. Don't feel bad for the seed. The seed's onto the better thing. And I think about it just in a very simple way. We had uh, a couple of the graduates come back to our high school class. I'm always trying to talk to high schoolers about how important high school is, but that it's not all there is, right? And that one of the reasons it matters is because there's better places to be, right? I, I, high school was not my favorite part of life. Like if someone offered me money to go back to high school, sometimes I wonder, how in the world am I a high school person? Why am I stuck in high school still? Um, because if you'd ask me, do you want to go back to high school? No. Um, college, maybe. Um, but high school, never. And yet, you know, you, you, so many of them, are, they cannot, they're scared of the future or they're not sure what's going to happen. And I keep trying to tell them it's going to be great. And what, I, what we did is we brought Bethany back in and, and one of the recent students who had graduated from our high school and is now in college. And I, I told the kids to like, take a look at them. I said, I want you to look at this and know there's life after high school, right? I mean, so often you're so wound up in what's right now and oh, this A or this A minus or this kid doesn't like me and there's like 12 kids in there or whatever. And you're like, these people, you will choose whether you ever want to talk to them again, right? It's just like over before you know it and they're in a better place now. And, you know, sometimes we think about those and I go, I, I don't know many people after they, they've gone through so many different things in life and say, oh, I, I'd love to go back to middle school. Whoo, was that the best years of my life or what? Why well, seventh grade, puberty kicking in, totally awkward. You know, I love it. You go, no, you graduated. And this is what he's saying. So often in life we think here we are and we think this is what it is. And he says, man, this pain and suffering and challenges and setbacks and all this stuff he says this is just the seed we plant it does matter because now affects them that's the only reason it matters and so i think about this that's what he says as he ends it up so it's written verse 45 the first man adam became a living being the last adam jesus christ became a life-giving spirit the spirit isn't first the natural, and afterward the spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As the man of dust, we were like him, we were like Adam, so we were made of dirt. And so's the heavenly man, and because of him, we will be heavenly. 
And he says in verse 49, as we born the image of the man of dust, we shall bear the man, image of the heavenly man. I invite you to go home and read these verses. Uh, I'll read them quickly again. I'm out of time. I don't want to keep your dusty selves. It, it, we're dust. You know, I can feel myself just sore in the seat, you know, and, and this is just proof of what he's saying here. He's saying your heavenly body won't be tired. It won't be sore. It won't suffer. It won't have the setbacks. He says, I say it, verse 50, brethren, that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit the incorruptible. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal, mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption, the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass what is saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What is that saying? This is the last thought, I promise. If it's not bigger than death, it's not worth living for. This is what he was basically saying. He's saying, like, it's got to be bigger than death. If it's smaller than death, it's on the losing side. It's just on the losing side, whatever it is. Uh, Success at work, he says, but, but everybody dies, and all that success at work dies with it. Doesn't mean we can't be successful at work. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be. He says, be steadfast and immovable. Don't, don't be a person who goes, oh, well, then nothing matters. No, it does. This matters so much because it's over so soon. That's what he's basically saying. He's saying, always abound in the work of the Lord. Plant seeds, man. Share the good news. Live it out through your life because it's not an if. And there's nothing iffy about Jesus. It's built on facts. It really did happen. It really did happen for him. And just as sure as death has been in other people we've looked in their life, we should not wonder. I wonder if I'll die. Of course you will. There's no if in it. It's a win, not an if. But here's the thing. It's a win, W-I-N. It's a win if you've answered the big if. And that's what he's saying. It's, it's a win, death. Where's your victory, death? You didn't win. You didn't get the last word. Jesus got the last word. And Jesus is the last word on that. It takes the sting out of it. It doesn't mean we don't grieve. We grieve as those who have hope, the Bible says. We grieve with a hopeful grief, a realistic grief that, yeah, man, this hurts. I love it because if it's not bigger than death, it's certainly not li worth living for. And even the biggest things don't outlive that. But the smallest things can. And that's why I love living that way because Jesus said, if you give a little cup of water to a kid in my name, you'll be rewarded on the other side. You may be forgotten here, but you won't be forgotten there. And I love that, that God would forget my sin and remember my service is an amazing thought. There's no if, ands, and buts about that. So God, thank you for the fact that these are more than just words here in your word. It's an incredible place that they're found. They're found in the word of God. They're found in, uh, mixed in with people who didn't even understand everything they were writing when they wrote it. And yet they wrote it and later we look back and say they were just predicting Jesus and what he did. And so in each one of our lives, I pray that we would have a past that is uh, very, very much solid on understanding that there's there's prophecy there's there's a foundation of facts there's reality to what we believe we're not just believing what we wish and want to believe in fact sometimes in the present it's very hard to believe what we believe uh, we might undergo additional uh, difficulty because of what we believe it's happened all throughout history it can certainly happen now but we also think of that future reality that just as sure as death is sure Life after death is sure, and just as sure as 
the suffering that we might have right now is there will be a glory, as the Bible says, that far outweighs them all. And so I pray that we would let these things soak deep into our souls, our lives, and be lived out even this week. We pray it in Jesus' name.